So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I am your interim host, Carl Smallwood. That's Carl with a K, Smallwood with a small followed by a wood. Yep, that's how it's spelled. And today we're talking about King James, one man, three kingdoms. And the thing I like to point out in Biographics, Geographics and Top 10 videos is that these videos are by no means a solitary effort on my part. In fact, I'm not the first, second, third, fourth, or probably even fifth person to have seen this script. Uh, I would hazard a guess that half a dozen people have had their hands and eyes on the page I'm reading from right now before I even like you know go into the place where it's stored to get it for recording this video. And of course, the first person's eyes and hands to touch the script are the original author, who in this case is one Ben Edelman. And you can give them a follow on the social media links below if you want to be a cool guy or gal like that. But let's get to the topic of today's video, shall we? Some men are born great, some achieve greatness, and some men are just plain old lucky. No one personifies this more than King James, who achieved by accident of birth what his ancestors had long dreamt of, uniting all of the kingdoms of the British Isles under one singular monarch. By wearing the crowns of both England and Scotland, James ended centuries of border warfare, even if it took another hundred years after his ascension for the two kingdoms to be formally moulded together into a single kingdom of Great Britain. It was an unlikely rise for a man who spent pretty much his entire childhood at the centre of palace intrigue and bloody political infighting. He became so paranoid of being assassinated himself that he wore thickly padded clothes to protect himself from the assassin's dagger or bullet. James tends to get a mixed grade from modern historians. He was a man with good intentions and grandiose plans, but was unable to follow through on most of them because of the shortcomings of his rather disappointing personality. Of all his faults, the most damaging was the rift he allowed to develop between the Crown and Parliament, setting the stage for the English Civil War some two decades after his death. When James was born on June 19th, 1566, he was immediately recognised as probably the most important baby in Scotland. After all, he was the heir to the kingdom's crown, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and her second husband, Lord Darnley. Mary was, shall we say, a controversial figure in Scotland. Not only was she a staunch Catholic, which put her at odds with her mostly Protestant subjects, but the initially happy marriage between herself and Darnley had quickly devolved into one of bitter hatred. For example, when Darnley was murdered on February 10th, 1567, the Queen was widely suspected to have been involved, and her protestations of innocence largely rang hollow after she went right ahead and married the Earl of Bothwell, believed to have been the man responsible for the assassination of Darnley just three months after the fact. When James was 13 months old, the Scottish nobility forced Mary to abdicate and he was crowned king in her place, so King Baby. As so often happens though, when a baby is in charge of a country, just, you know, make your own jokes about that one, folks. You know, Americans and Brits, we can, this is one thing we can agree on most of the time, just as an idiot in charge. The realm collapsed into chaos and civil war. Four different regents ruled over Scotland during James's minority, all of whom died quite violently. When the young king was just five years old, he watched as his paternal grandfather was brought into Stirling Castle, fatally injured following a raid on the city by supporters of James's mother. The incident is said to have deeply traumatised him, and for the rest of his life, he would suffer from an intense fear at the sight of unsheathed swords or knives, part of a wider fear of being assassinated later in his life. The violence that too often surrounded Scottish court politics was not the only challenging thing young James had to deal with. For example, as a child he was entrusted to the care of a wet nurse that was said to be overly fond of drink, causing her to either drop the child or neglect him. And I didn't think a wet nurse could get away with dropping a child once, let alone a child that rules the country you live in. But that that's what happened and the neglect was so severe that James developed very weak legs and his right foot turned permanently outwards so that he walked with a limp pretty much his entire life. James's tutor, George Buchanan, was also a strong proponent of the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child, and he regularly beat his charge for the smallest of infractions. And again, I'm baffled that someone was able to just 
beat the king with a stick, but that that's what happened. As for the boy's mother, he never saw her again. Mary eventually escaped across the border into England, where she was immediately arrested by her sister, Queen Elizabeth, for the following two decades. Now, still, despite these hardships, the king did grow into an intelligent, strong-willed man, and he proved to be an able ruler when he took the reins of power for himself in 1583. But James had larger ambitions than to rule over what was considered to be at the time a small, poor kingdom on the outer fringes of Europe. His eye was set on a far juicier prize, the throne of England. Queen Elizabeth was inarguably one of the most popular monarchs England had ever had. She was also unmarried and childless and had no close relatives left alive to take the throne when she died, leaving the question of succession a vexing one to English nobility. The man with the strongest claim to inherit the throne, as it turned out, was the King of Scotland. His great-grandmother, Margaret Tudor, was Elizabeth's aunt, making them both descendants of King Henry VII. No one else had a closer claim than James, except of course for his own mother, Mary, who was still locked up in England and the centrepiece of a number of Catholic plots against Elizabeth's life. The last of these ended with Mary on the chopping block in 1587. She died still considering herself to be the rightful queen of both Scotland and England. So, even though James publicly protested the death of his mother privately, he was probably kind of relieved to have her just out of the way. He never had a relationship with her after all, and he was raised Protestant, and she never even recognised him as her successor while she was still alive. Her death also cleared the way for an issue-free succession to the English crown. Over the following years, James did pretty much everything he could to ensure he stayed in Elizabeth's good graces. He signed the Treaty of Berwick in 1586, establishing, and I quote, amity and friendship between the two countries, which saw Scotland remaining neutral during England's war with Spain in 1588. And that conflict is probably worth mentioning because it's where the English Royal Navy and the weather teamed up to take out the vaunted Spanish Armada. And James, just to keep in England's good graces, even took an annual pension from Elizabeth that was contingent on him pursuing pro-English policies in Scotland. James's decades of waiting finally paid off in March 1603 when Elizabeth died, having ruled England for some 44 years. The last couple of years, her chief minister, Robert Cecil, had engaged in secret correspondence with James in order to ensure a smooth transition of power. All the worrying that had been done about the succession, though, was largely for nothing. Most everyone accepted James as England's new king without a real fuss. In fact, they, they welcomed him, James's journey south to London, so I'm treated like a conquering hero. In a way, he kind of was. His ascension made him the first uncontested king of both Scotland and England, as well as Ireland. Centuries of fighting and raids across the border of the two countries came to an end virtually overnight, and there was no longer a need to maintain expensive fortresses on the border like Berwick. As he made his plans to transfer his court to England from Scotland, James promised the Scottish nobles he was leaving behind that he would return once every three years. Like many promises James would make to people over the following years, this would not be one he kept. He would return to Scotland only once during the entirety of his rule, some 14 years later. James found that he liked England much better than he ever liked Scotland. For one thing, the Church of England had the monarch as its supreme governor, and was far more willing to defer to the king in religious matters, as opposed to the Scottish Kirk, which had been bitterly fighting for its independence from royal authority for pretty much James's entire life. But what really impressed James, though, was the massive increase in wealth that came with the English crown, dwarfing the revenues he received as King of Scotland. He began to spend this money at a frenetic pace, particularly on gifts to his courtier. And it's worth noting that this was a fairly common practice at the time, as it was fairly easy to just buy the loyalty of your underlings with gifts and titles from the royal largesse. But in James's case, it was done so excessively and without sufficient return in the form of services to the crown. At least not services to the crown in the traditional sense, as we'll get to. In order to get more money, James needed to summon Parliament, which chafed at his idea of kingship. In his mind, God had chosen him to rule, and as such, he shouldn't have to answer to any of his subjects for anything he wanted to do. Parliament, quite obviously, disagreed, and over the course of his reign, James had a 
shall we say, contentious relationship with Parliament, which had up to that point usually enjoyed a rather harmonious relationship with the monarch. Parliament was not James's only enemy, however. After initially promising toleration towards England's Catholic population, he soon embarked on a policy of state-sponsored persecution towards followers of the old faith, ordering Jesuits and Catholic priests to leave the country and fining subjects who did not attend church services on a Sunday. An act of Parliament was actually proposed in 1605 that would formally outlaw all Catholic worship within England. A militant group of English Catholics felt that the only way to save their religion was to assassinate not only the king, but pretty much the entire government. What followed was the Gunpowder Plot, perhaps the most famous act of treason in British, if not world history. The plan was to fill a room in the cellar directly below the House of Lords in the Palace of Westminster in London with barrels and barrels of gunpowder, and then set it off at the state opening of Parliament on November 5th, 1605. The entire government would be in attendance. The King, the Queen, his heir, Prince Henry, the Privy Council, and both Houses of Parliament. And following this decapitation strike, there would be a Catholic uprising which would put James's daughter, Elizabeth, on the throne as a Catholic puppet queen. The plot came perilously close to succeeding. The 36 barrels of gunpowder placed in the undercroft, according to modern reconstructions, was powerful enough to kill everyone within 300 feet of the building, as well as obviously everyone inside. However, an attempt to warn some of the Catholic members of Parliament to stay away from the state opening backfired, and the plot was uncovered by the authorities. On November 4th, the gunpowder was discovered, along with the man whose job it was to ignite it. Guy Fawkes. Under torture, he admitted to everything and the rest of the conspirators fled for their lives. And Guy Fawkes would be a fascinating figure to cover here on Biographics, but we're going to do a Cliff Notes version of what happened next. For anyone curious? So what happened next was fairly swift and brutal, let's put it lightly. So the guys that Guy Fawkes was conspiring with did not get far, and two men, including the plot's ringleader Robert Catesby, were killed in a shootout with the Sheriff of Worcester on November 8th, and eight men, including Guy Fawkes himself, were eventually convicted of high treason and sentenced to the awful punishment of being hanged, drawn, and quartered. And, and I won't go into too much detail about what being hanged, drawn, and quartered involved, because you could probably use your imagination, but for anyone who is curious, it involved being hanged until you were nearly dead, being taken down and having your innards removed from your body, of course, you know, while you were still alive, at which point they would then attach leather straps to your wrists, your ankles, which would then be attached to horses who would be instructed to run in four different directions at once. Uh, that's like what the historical counts that it looked like, but obviously it didn't always go down like that. Sometimes they just like, you know, cut your legs off with an axe or something like that. But yeah, that that's that's what happened. And Guy Fawkes, he got it rough. He got it rough. So James was quick to exploit the lucky escape, taking full credit for uncovering the scheme and ascribing his deliverance as being a divine miracle. Proof further the fact he was a direct descendant of God. To his credit, he didn't take the opportunity to further persecute English Catholics, insisting that only a radical minority had been responsible, though it would take centuries for the official restrictions on Catholicism in England to be rescinded. Catholics would hold positions of power throughout James's reign, and November 5th, meanwhile, is still annually celebrated in Britain as Guy Fawkes Night, or more colloquially, Bonfire Night, which is filled with bonfires and fireworks, which for the Americans means that, yes, we in England really do celebrate the almost total destruction of our government by lighting fires and setting off fireworks, just like you do on July 4th. Also not mentioned in the script is the fact that a common practice on Guy Fawkes Night is to burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes himself, colloquially known as The Guy. And a thing you can do, at least in the north of England where I grew up, um, to you know, make a little bit of extra money closer to um, uh, November 5th, is you build the effigy and then you go out asking for a penny for The Guy. So, you know, to buy sweets and stuff for the evening, which is always like, you know, a fun pastime I had as a kid of just, you know, making a man out of straw to then take around asking for money to buy sweets with, at which point we'd then throw the man made of straw onto a fire and set up a bunch of fireworks. My country is weird. And no doubt there's a few people out there who noticed that the events of November 5th all those years ago was used as a motif in the film V for Vendetta, which... I contend is one of the most frustrating films to watch because just they got the message of Guy Fawkes just so, so wrong. As I mentioned, like, you know, earlier in this video, the whole point of the gunpowder plot was to, you know, 
admittedly, yes, get rid of like the autocratic government in place, but they wanted to then replace that with their own, like, you know, autocratic government leadership. Just they wanted a Catholic theocracy to be in place to rule England in its stead. But then the figure, or at least the visage of Guy Fawkes, has now become like this symbol of like anti authority. Like, you know, the V for Vendetta mask that people wear of, like, being anti-authority. It's like, no, they were pro-authority, just a different kind of it. But again, topic for another day. Let's move on. So the plot also made James even more paranoid than he already was about being assassinated. Which, yeah, fair. They almost blew him and, like, 400 other people up. Also, yeah, should also point out if any fans of Game of Thrones, like, you know, the bit where they blow up the thing, like the, the wildfire, um, that was partially inspired um, by this as well. As is much of Game of Thrones, like, you know, it's largely inspired by a lot of English history, uh, specifically the so called War of the Roses between uh, York and Lancaster. And in regards to King James, he was so paranoid that someone would just walk up and stab him in the street that for the rest of his life, whenever he appeared in public, he would wear specially padded clothing that was supposed to withstand the point of a dagger and potentially even a pistol ball. His odd choice of clothing, combined with his awkward gait and terrible table manners, meant that he was mocked by many of his contemporaries as lacking majesty. In other words, he didn't act in the way they thought a king should which King James didn't mind because he was a king. Like, it's that thing, it's like, well, they would criticise him, it's like, but it doesn't matter because I am the king. Anything I do is, by definition, kingly. Initially, James left the day-to-day -day running of the government to Cecil and Elizabeth ministers, leaving him free to pursue more leisurely activities like hunting. When Cecil died in 1612, James began to take more of an active role in the running of government, which is where he began to run into trouble. It had been well known for years that James liked to surround himself with oodles upon oodles of handsome young male courtiers, and as he grew older, he had no compunction about giving his favourites power, wealth and authority, whether they were able to administer it or not. The problem with these royal favourites is the same one that repeats itself throughout most of human history. The other people became jealous that they were not being similarly favoured, and that only got worse when the favourites weren't up to the tasks awarded to them, as was the case with one Robert Carr, the Earl of Somerset, who fell out of royal favour after a scandal in which his wife is said to have poisoned a friend in the Tower of London to keep him from contesting their marriage. Now, the exact nature of the relationship between James and all these young, handsome men has been debated for centuries and will likely be debated for centuries more. On the one hand, James had no bedroom trouble with his queen, Anne of Denmark. She was pregnant at least a dozen times over the course of their marriage, and, you know, of those pregnancies, like three bore children that survived infancy, including his eventual successor, Prince Charles. Not that one. On the other hand, there are many, many contemporary accounts of James engaging in behaviour with his favourites that would go beyond the bounds of platonic friendship. For example, consider the following quote. I never saw any fond husband make so much or so great dalliance over his beautiful spouse as I have seen King James over his favourites, especially the Duke of Buckingham. This was written by one chronicler, while another was more to the point, albeit a little more crude, stating, and I quote, it is well known that the King of England f the Duke of Buckingham. Speaking of the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers experienced a meteoric rise due to his relationship with the king, going from the 21-year-old son of a minor country gentleman in 1614 to the kingdom's only duke of non-royal blood in 1623. James, who was 26 years his senior, was seemingly obsessed with the young duke, a sentiment that George apparently reciprocated if the steamy letters exchanged between them are to be believed. For example, consider the following quote. God bless you, my sweet child and wife, and grant that ye may ever be a comfort to your dear father and husband. James wrote this in a 1623 letter, to which Buckingham replied, I naturally so love your person, adore all of your other parts, which are more than ever one man had. It's hard not to read that in a bit of a gay way. But again, we don't know conclusively. So, amazingly, Buckingham also had a quite good relationship with Prince Charles. Again, not that one, who probably viewed the much older man as a bigger brother figure of sort, something the heir sorely needed after the death of his own brother, Prince Henry in 1612 from typhoid fever. This included an ill-fated visit to Spain in 1623 in an attempt to secure the daughter of the King of Spain as a wife for Charles, which apparently ended so badly that the prince came home determined to go to war with the Spanish. And I've had some bad days, and I'm not saying that they were worse than that, but I get it.
Despite the often contentious relationship James had with his subjects, he did achieve a number of successes during his reign which have made a significant impact on history. He commissioned, for example, a new English translation of the Bible known colloquially as the King James's Version, which is still used in many Christian churches and homes to this very day. Meanwhile, Jamestown, the first permanent settlement in what would become the United States of America, was named after him and introduced the wonders of tobacco to England and Europe at large, though James himself was not said to be a fan writing in one pamphlet in 1604 that the smell of tobacco smoke was, and I quote, hateful to the nose. I'm inclined to agree. Moving on to the English Renaissance, this began under Elizabeth, but continued under James, particularly in the theatre, with William Shakespeare's acting company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, being rebranded to simply The King's Men after receiving a royal patent. Some of the Bard's most famous works, including Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, were written under official auspices of King James. In the meantime, James also pushed for the unification of England and Scotland into a single Kingdom of Great Britain, rather than maintaining their current status as separate realms ruled together by one king in personal union. He met significant pushback from both English and Scottish nobles. Naturally. Yeah, I, I live here. I, we're a very contentious people. So the Scots worried that their realm was going to be subjugated by the English, while the English worried about, quote-unquote, foreigners taking over their own realm. In the end, James was unable to achieve a unitary state in his lifetime. This would not be achieved until 1707, but this didn't stop him from being the first monarch to sign himself as the King of Great Britain, even if Great Britain didn't technically exist just yet. And parts of that story remind me of just the most evergreen Simpsons moment where groundskeeper Willie just like wax is poetic about the you know the contentious nature of brothers and sisters like brothers and sisters they're natural enemies like scots and the english or scots and the japanese or scots and other scots those damn scots they ruin scotland to which principal skinner says ah you scots are a contentious people and it's like you've just made an enemy for life and as exaggerated as that sounds i have a very close friend from scotland specifically one of the small islands off the scottish coast and they told me that there are people from that island who will refer to people from the mainland, not some 10, 20 miles away, as simply being from away. Uh, they consider that anyone who is not from that small island to be from away, even if you can quite literally see where they are from from your front window. Likewise, the small town that I grew up in had a very fierce rivalry with a town that you could literally see from your bedroom window. And whenever I mention this to Americans, they're always so incredulous. And I get it, it is ridiculous. And I think just a minor petty example that just serves to show or just like just how argumentative um, uh, you know, British people can be is that there is a just well-known rite of passage with anyone who attends university, because university is generally the place where you're gonna meet people from you know other parts of the country, if not the entire world. And an argument, I think every British student has with their first year housemates is what do you call a bread cake? And for Americans, that would be like, you know, a burger bun. What would you call a burger bun? And there are about 30 to 40 different colloquial terms um, uh, for that particular thing. And everyone in the UK is convinced that the word they have for it is the only correct word. And just every, every year, universities across the country will just have students having this argument. Anyway, much more controversially, James also authorised the plantation of Ulster, the establishment of British settlements in the northern parts of Ireland, in order to, uh, you know, British people suck in history, civilise it. The transplants were considered the exact opposite of the native Irish, English-speaking and Protestant as opposed to Gaelic-speaking and Catholic. The plantation established the modern map of Northern Ireland, and is the reason why, to this day, the northern part of Ireland continues to be considered part of the UK, as opposed to the Republic of Ireland. And this is just is an issue way too complex to get into in this video. It is fascinating, it is incredibly frustrating, and, like, you know, it is basically still an issue to this day. And hopefully one day we can cover it in full, but we do not have time now. But suffice to say, yeah, we suck. <sighs> so one aspect in which James is considered to be much more successful is keeping his realms out of foreign wars. James abhorred violence, especially war, and also recognised how expensive war was. Soon after his ascension to the English throne, his commissioners 
formally ended his long-running war with Spain in the Treaty of London in 1604, and he would spend pretty much the rest of his life doing his utmost to keep his country out of further military entanglements. And this was at times taken to extremes. Sir Walter Raleigh, a favourite of Queen Elizabeth, was one of the foremost explorers and naval captains of his day. In 1618, however, James had him executed, largely just to appease the Spanish, who accused him of being a pirate, which he was. But he was an English pirate, so got away with it while... You know, the monarch was like, yeah, screw Spain. Again, it's a fascinating story, but it's one for another day. As James grew older, his health began to fail him. He suffered from gout and arthritis that made it difficult to walk or even hold a pen, as well as frequent stomach complaints and kidney stones that turned his urine, and I quote, the colour of dark red wine. He was also depressed as he was increasingly sidelined by Prince Charles and Buckingham who assumed more and more control over the government and were pushing for war with Habsburgs in defiance of James's wishes. He died on March 27th in 1625 after suffering from malaria, a stroke and then dysentery back to back, the, the medieval triple threat as it was known, at the age of 58. The end of the Jacobean era was widely mourned by his subjects. In spite of his many, many personal flaws, James had kept the country out of war and as a result taxes were relatively low throughout his reign, which was pretty much all the common people really cared about. Which is fair, because to the common person, the only two questions they really cared about the answer to are, are the taxes low? Are we at war? And it's like, yes, no, okay, we're done. And everything else, it's all gravy after that. As for King James's boy toy, the Duke of Buckingham, he continued to be his son's favourite until 1628, when a disgruntled army officer named John Felton assassinated him after believing that the Duke had cheated him out of a promotion. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, not far away from the king he loved so much. As for Charles, he inherited James's ideas on kingship and his dislike of Parliament, which was to have very fatal immediate consequences for both himself and the realm. He would be executed by his own subjects, in 1649 after losing the English Civil War, the monarchy itself abolished for over a decade. King James, and as an aside here, has the uncomfortable regnal name of James VI and I, since he was the sixth James to be the King of Scotland, but the first to be King of England, has a conflicted legacy in the centuries that have passed since his death. He was largely blamed for laying the foundations of the English Civil War through his absolutist policies and general attitude towards kingship, which he passed down to his son. He also suffered from the poison pen of a chronicler, and from Walden, who wrote the court and character of King James I, widely seen as a smear campaign by a man with an axe to grind, but for centuries was taken at face value as a contemporary historical account. In recent decades, however, his reputation has been somewhat rehabilitated by modern historians, who point to the stability of his government in the early part of his English reign, as well as in Scotland, and his enlightened, for the time, views on subjects like war and religion. He definitely doesn't hurt that homosexual relationships, whether implied or not, are no longer seen as an inherent character flaw like they used to be in the past. Now this doesn't mean that he was perfect however, much of the criticism levied against him is still perfectly valid some 400 years later. At his core, James was a deeply flawed man, desperately craving for the love and affection he was denied as a child, but also seeking absolute control over everything and everyone around him. This combination would be bad enough for an ordinary citizen, but when you're the ruler of not one country, but three, it gets even worse. Men have been decried as tyrants for much less. Whether or not that applies to King James though, we'll leave that up to you. Yes, I hope everyone found this video to be educational, entertaining and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things, and if you are inclined to agree, you can let the author Ben Edelman know at the social media links they provided for us below. Well, as for me, I've been your host, Carl Smallwood. You can like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, follow our sister channels, Geographics and Top Tens, and as I always like to say, go out there and have the day that you deserve. Cheers.